Welcome everybody, um, wherever you are, whichever country you're in. Um, some of you would be listening live, others to the recording, which will, we will upload in a, a couple of days time. Uh, the recordings are very important because right from University of West Indies to Macquarie University, Australia, to University of Zagreb, Several universities are using the recordings for tutorials and uh, in various areas, uh, not just museum studies or heritage studies, but across the spectrum in history, so humanities, ecological humanities, all kinds of courses. Uh, we usually have three to four people, usually three uh, on the panel. And why we started the Heritage Matters webinars is when the pandemic started, suddenly everything shut down. Three things, you know, there was a triangulation of three things, the pandemic situation, and uh, then there is Black Lives Matter and climate crisis. We say climate crisis, we don't say climate change. That's too gentle. I think we are near the tipping point, if not over it. So it's a crisis, it's an emergency situation. And uh, so the triangulation of this, either we can, you know, the, the pandemic as a portal, Arundhati Roy, uh, the well-known Indian author wrote that the pandemic is a portal. Either we can drag through our baggage and still do more of the same, or we can change. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our approach has been that, how can we deal with change? And uh, so we had a number of, a range of webinars and all the recordings are uploaded and you can access them uh, and you can use them. They're sponsored, supported by Anand National University generously. Um, and uh, so what is that? Why we talk about cultural immers immersions, educational immersions and cultural action. In mid eighties, when I was the national director of affirmative action for indigenous uh, participation in museums, national parks, and so on in Australia, I found that the existing curriculum and pedagogy was very inadequate, very much that conventional archaeological, anthropological pedagogy and curricula that perpetuated the notion of self and the other very strongly. So when I had to rework the you know, curricula, I worked with Aboriginal elders from across Australia in all Aboriginal committee, and the academic committee chaired by a very eminent uh, Australian scholar who is no more, Professor John Mulvaney. And, uh, and, and what I did was I developed a curricula where it included the academy, the laboratory, very applied. I mean, I had 26,000 objects for teaching purposes, but also immersions in the field to work with the elders, to work in the field. So learning was, you know, fairly, distributed across the Australian landscape. And then I found it quite useful. Subsequently, I ran a number of immersions, I don't know how many, over the years. And, uh, and Ray Sheridan has been in Vietnam with me um, and uh, through the University of Queensland. But since then, or since before that, no, since then, Ray has been in Ladakh almost a year and she's been in Delhi the Human Rights Commission in East Timor, and she's got extensive experience. Ray, would you like to start off? What is the, why are cultural emotions important for people to feel empowered for cultural action in their personal lives and their communities and so on? Thank you, Amar. I'd first like to welcome everybody and acknowledge country because I'm in here in Brisbane. And I recognising I am on Turbul and Jagara country, I pay respect to First Nations elders past, present and future. I recognise that their land was stolen and sovereignty was never ceded. I acknowledge the 200 plus years of ongoing resistance to colonisation and over 60,000 years of First Nations culture, language and resilience. On reflection, my experience in the three immersions I've had in the three areas that uh, Professor Gala has mentioned. Uh, first of all, 
led me to understand that my first learning was deep listening because the deep listening went and evolved into community engagement. But if there wasn't that deep listening at the onset, then what you could contribute or what you could learn was very limited. My second learning was that one shop stop doesn't, is not an answer to any educational or, or cultural change project. That has to be very carefully cultured and uh, adapted to the, the prospect that which you're being uh, confronted. For instance, I, on reflection of, of my three immersions, those three societies in which I interacted with were on the scale of trauma. And it was very interesting to see that the most traumatized society, the society in Timor-Leste, East Timor, was the one that had needed the most attention, but also the most listening, and is still going through a very contorted and difficult uh, period. The, East, the Vietnamese uh, experience I had with Professor Gala visiting World Heritage Sites, having a village stay, uh, vi visiting many museums, villages, was absolutely comprehensive and of enormous privilege because we met directors, we met farmers, we met young people, old people, we ate with, with, uh, with families. It was a society that is sort of going through a post-trauma experience as relation to the uh, American war. And it was fascinating to see how their learnings related, were ambivalent in relating to their history and their curriculum and where they put their, their public museum, uh, uh, how they develop their public museum uh, culture. The most uh, adapted society was in Ladakh. Uh, I worked for um, a, as a teacher and um, with some museum experience being contributed as well in SECMOL as the student education and uh, cultural movement of Ladakh for four months. This society had only been uh, open to the West since 1976 and the first influences were not uh, those that were interested in resources, but those were that were NGOs, and they were marvelously uh, transition deep listening people that educated the leaders of Ladakh in Western countries. They sent them there for a year or so, and then they came back. And that society then became very confident with their leaders and their leaders' orientations as to how they developed their education system, how they uh, we became almost an independent state now with their own governance. They are the most equipped, I feel, for the trauma that is going to affect all the groups that we're going to work with from now on in that climate change. My third, so my third uh, learning would be that I see my role and perhaps others might agree with me as more an ally in developing educational programs. I see allyship as a aspirational area which we will be probably have the most influential uh, long-term successful educational and cultural for change experiences. Thanks Ray, I, I think that's wonderful. Uh, one is deep listening. The second key word is uh, developing empathy. And uh, the third one is uh, becoming an ally in cultural action and change. Mm -hmm. And uh, beautifully put from th three different emotions. Uh, we'll come back to you uh, at the end of the uh, presentations. Now, David, we, we met uh, when I was working in Leiden. Uh, and, and responsible for cultural diversity programming in Dutch museums. And it was a cultural diversity programming immersion out of which came the uh, Inclusive Museum Research Network. And there were 16 PhD students and uh, 
from different parts of the world, I think 10 different countries. And uh, we had a fantastic time looking at uh, not only the national museums, but local museums and the immersions. And, uh, and of course, it was quite also uh, dramatic because I think when we finished at the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam, Theo van Gogh was murdered. That's so right. Throwing yeah. the Dutch, Dutch society out of uh, balance, you know, sort of from being the most benevolent uh, multicultural society became very oppositional. So tell me, I, it's a long time ago, but you, uh, you know, I'm sure you've experienced other immersions. What is it that you remember? No, all those years ago, and on, honestly, I would have to look at my CV to remember what year I participated in this. It feels like, you know, Who's decades 2004 ago. 2004 November, David. Oh, my goodness. That's maybe I shouldn't have asked. Yeah, that was really quite a long time ago. But all these years later, it's really stuck with me because um, it had such an impact on my development as a student and also played a really strong role in my desire to work in the museum field, um, in spite of all the problems I think that we have in the field. Um, and just to, to give you a few reflections, I mean, I think for me, the most important aspect of that experience was not the content even of what we learned, although that was very important, it was the kind of strong learning cohort that was built up through that experience among the PhD students for sure, but we also learned to, we, we started to imagine ourselves, we could imagine ourselves as professionals, right, as more senior scholars at some point, as being part of this uh, community of learners and scholars, really. And that was, um, I, I have to say, the, the, the aspect that really stays with me um, uh, the most, um, you know, again, as you said, we were from different parts of the world, from different institutions, in yet another country, another cultural environment. And so that experience, um, not just of being in this immersive environment, learning environment together, but also being taken out of our normal day-to-day um, -day lives um, was incredibly, had an incredibly strong impact on me. So, so that really was, uh, that's what converted me to the, these types of experiences. Um, also, I think the fact that it wasn't just like a, a quick conference or symposium, but it really was, um, I, and again, Professor Gali, you have to remind me how long <laughs> the overall program was, but say again? Eight days. Eight days, yeah. So it's a considerable amount of time. Um, and that really allowed us to, as a group, not only spend time with our cohort, but also with our hosts. So of visiting various, it was a jam-packed schedule, as I remember, our agenda was really full, but seeing um, different uh, institutions and all the, you know, the colleagues who work there was, was wonderful. But even though it was really busy uh, time, we, we always felt that we had sufficient amount of time with each, um, you know, individual who was teaching us, right, who were, we were learning from and learning with. And I think that sense of doing a deep dive um, into a, a particular moment, a particular um, institution was again, incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, we really felt like, I think we were getting an incredibly special view into um, the way, you know, museums uh, operated for one thing. Um, and and the, the issues that the you know, museum professionals were grappling with. Um, so you mentioned the um, assassination. Um, that was sort of uh, just one you know, moment of the world intruding in a sense onto our little bubble. But actually what we saw was that um, um, people in the, these various Dutch institutions were thinking about you know, more diverse societies. They were thinking about geopolitics. They were thinking about even the more day-to-day -day mundane issues of collections management or seemingly mundane. So we were able to get that view. And that was really because we spent so much time with, with our, our hosts, I would say. And that was, that was really a wonderful way to give PhD students in particular a sense of what it meant to work in a museum. And then finally, I would say, um, you know, at the end of the program, each participant had a chance to sort of 
um, you know, share their own reflections, um, talk about their experiences there. And this kind of opportunity to sort of consolidate one's experience and one's knowledge, you know, gained through the program, I think was really critical, both sort of on an individual level to, to sort of make sure that sort of one left the program with a sense of what had happened, right, and what um, these experiences meant, but also as a way to kind of further kind of get to know the other members of the cohort, because we all kind of metabolize, we all um, sort of learn in different ways, we all take different things away, and to, to really have that sort of deep respect for um, the way uh, other um, humans experience the world, I think, was a was really, really um, kind of meaningful and touching. It was actually quite emotional, um, as I recall, at the end of the experience. It was such a, um, you know, intensive um, time for, for all of us. So, yeah, it was a, something that uh, clearly, I think you can tell, has stayed with me all these years. Uh, I think it's a really powerful um, experience for people. So thank you. Thank you, Ed. I think you, I love the expression you use, which applies to all the emotions that I've organized. Deep dive into the moment. That's what you say. I think that that is a beautiful way of putting it because that's what in Vietnam too, that uh, Ray was mentioning, you know, sort of it's 21 days, it's packed. Uh, it's an immersion uh, to take people out of their comfort zone and to, but in a collaborative learning environment so that it's not individuals, but it's together we learn. And also the other thing is in all the immersions, I made sure that uh, it's collaborative learning and teaching environment where it's not just directors but it, and leaders, but it's also local community experts, knowledge people, everybody participating. Uh, like in Vietnam, I used to go and train the Vietnamese beforehand brief them and ask them to pose problems. So it was about problem solving. And I think what you all did in the, in, in the Netherlands, which is why you know the directors of so many national museums joined you, is they were looking for answers. And you are a whole cohort of 16 young people with brilliant researchers, with different perspectives that were listening to you. Uh, I've never seen museum directors listen so intently you know, to young people. And, and I think Ray said deep listening. If all museum directors would do some deep listening, <laughs> I think the world would be, the world of museums would be much better. Okay, well, we'll now move on to Jerry. Jerry, tell us about your experience with the Bhopal immersion. You did recently a poster on it. Tell us, I mean, coming from Jamaica, uh, what was it all about? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? I, I didn't quite get you. I said that w your immersion in Bhopal, could you uh, reflect yes. on it? Um, okay, so, so I did the immersion with Professor Gala as part of the Anand Fellowship. So we did the module in two parts, I remember quite distinctly. So before we got to the museum, I remember Professor Gala had sent us like these maybe 100 or 200 articles on various heritage um, issues. And we were to select five of those and then, you know, summarize them and return them to him, you know, telling what we understood. And when I got that first assignment, my first thought was, oh my God, <laughs> I shouldn't have done this course. And then the following week, we went to Bhopal and we stayed at the um, museum there. And that completely changed the whole direction and perspective of the course. Because of course, you know, you can take articles, you can read them, you can summarize them and you can understand a perspective of someone who has been there and done that. But when you go there yourself and you walk about the place, you see things you, you don't touch, <laughs> you don't touch, but you can get a, a sense of what the heritage really is, you know, a sense of the people that were actually part of this space that created these exhibits. Um, th that creates a, quite unique perspective about it because more than 
just learning, you know, the things that were the objective of the module, we got to be a part of it and experience. I, I can say for sure that, you know, in my life, I don't see another situation outside of Professor Gala's course in Annan Fellowship. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't see another situation outside of the course where I would have lived in a museum for eight, nine days or so, where I would have been part of the uh, immersive experience in that way. So it was quite um, unique for me and I'm sure for all the other Anand fellows who were there at the time. Uh, because, uh, so one of the things that we had meant to do was to look at the museum, how the museum had operating and what kind of proposals we could do. So uh, in order to improve the experience of um, visitors when they came to the museum, how we could, you know, what kind of suggestions we could give to the management of the museum in order to help with how some of the exhibits were showcased and interacted with and, you know, these uh, other things. Um, our module had, I think, 30 fellows, yeah, 30 fellows that were there who were from very diverse backgrounds. So I think unlike, you know, Ray and David, where, you know, they were studying history or, you know, matters specifically related to museum management or uh, anthropology or something. In our case, this were, you know, we were 30 different people from different backgrounds from six different countries who were here now giving this perspective about something that was being introduced to us, but in a way where we weren't just reading about it. So Professor Gala didn't just take a lecture and say, okay, um, that's all the information you need, all the best with your future. He brought us there and said, okay, if you want to learn about it, this is the way, be part of it. Try to understand you know, from the perspective of the um, people who lived here, whose exhibition it is that you're seeing. And you know, it was very long days, like eight hour days walking about all the whole, I think it's 200 acres that whole museum was. And um, we went into the caves and Professor Gala could tell us some of the more personal stories of when they were doing the excavation works there. You know, um, he narrated that, okay, you know, I remember I was standing down there and those are elements that outside of immersion you don't get to know because typically you know that's not included in written articles or um, public lectures this is something that unless you are part of the experience in the moment you wouldn't otherwise have so one of the key takeaways for me coming out of that module is for one that the hands-on way of learning is 10 times better. It gives you the experiential knowledge that you wouldn't otherwise have. The second thing is, you know, when you learn with someone like Professor Gala, you are getting access to, um, you know, these kind of things. I live in a museum. I don't know how many even museum experts are able to say that, that they lived in a uh, museum, but more so, you know, you got to, I got to experience the, what I imagine would have been, you know, take away all the modern things that I had while I was there, but some of the real things that they would have had, the cycle of day into night, what happens when the daylight, when no one is there at the museum yet, what happens when the museum closes, and so on. It was a very beautiful experience, and I can't imagine you know, if not, if I had not been an Anand fellow, if there's any other way I would have been able to experience that. So thank you. Thanks, Sharifa. Uh, a lot of the listeners don't know what Anand Fellowship is. Could you tell them, uh, please? Sure, sure. So Anand Fellowship is a one-year postgraduate diploma that focuses on the built environment. Um, this is based at the Anand National University in India. So it's a very multidisciplinary and diverse um, program, which brings together 
solutionaries, as we are called, from around the world who look at the built environment or man-made environment and try to see how we can design solutions to some of the problems that we have ourselves caused. So whether this is related to the climate crisis, whether it is to social issues, whether it's to political, economical issues, whatever. So we work together. And one of the key part of the program is in fact the immersive experience, where through the various projects that we work on throughout the entire year, you not only just read and um, write a, a theoretical proposal for a problem, you actually do the hands-on component where you design the solution and as best as you can, you know, you're guided by the mentors and faculty at Anantu to implement that solution. So it just doesn't stay on paper anymore. It becomes a real solution that is implemented. And many fellows like myself go on after the fellowship to still continue working on those problems in order to create a better solution. And what I like about the program as well is it's a global cohort. So, you know, in the next 10, 15 years, this will be, a, we'll have a network across the entire world, in fact, of people who are working together with similar principles, who are uh, focused on, you know, solution, who are solution oriented, working in a similar way to do this um, problem solving and trying to correct some of our own issues that we have. Um, created. Thanks, Jerry. That's uh, put very succinctly. In the chat box, you got the link to the Anand Fellowship Program, anybody who wants to check it out. Uh, because uh, some of you, I mean, I know quite a few people who registered from different parts of the world, from Sweden to Finland to Australia to Barbados, you name it. Um, you're all keep wondering what the hell is Amar doing in India? Well, this is a fellowship where I teach and I work with as a UNESCO chair and professor. And I really enjoyed after 43 years of working in different parts of the world, I'm just bringing back my experience home where I was born, brought up and educated to share with you the next generation. In fact, when I look at Jerry, I think it's not next, it's next, next generation. <laughs> it's sharing. So the link is there if anybody wants to know where I am. Uh, but thanks. And Jerry, the, uh, you know, that kind of hands-on, uh, you know, sort of uh, and trying to, trying experiential learning through hands-on experiences is one thing. But I think you quite rightly pointed out uh, something that I introduced into teaching and pedagogy is autoethnography. Mm. Uh, it's part of my own life journey, you know, sort of over the more than four decades, there's a lot that I learned and how I learned. And people really appreciate if, you know, if instructors and lecturers could actually reflect on their own life journey and uh, what it was like, you know, at different stages of my life being a student. I'm still a student. It's all about lifelong learning. That Shadwari reminded me just before we started. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I think that's wonderful, Jerry. And uh, enjoy Jamaica. And, thank you. Uh, um, Sharvari, she didn't know that I was going to ask her. She was. Uh, she's my manager. She's organizing the webinar. And I thought, my God, why can't I know Sharvari? She's um, uh, she's she spent six months with me in the birthplace of Mahayana Buddhism. You know, everybody knows Buddhism took birth in northern India. But Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, uh, which is uh, the sacred religion, faith for His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And he often said, in fact, he said that in the Australian parliament, the most sacred place for him in India is Amaravati. It's a place where I was born and brought up. And, and when I came back to India, I was there working on the Mahasupa, the largest stupa in South Asia and various sites. And Shavari came and spent six months with three others uh, from the Anand Fellowship. Shadri, what was it all like? I mean, sort of, I mean, like uh, Jerry was talking about eight months, it was full on. David already indicated full on, no break. Ray can tell you it was 21 days nonstop immersion. 
these are immersions where you get out of your skin and you really experience the difference. What was it like, so, you know, six months in Amravati? Just a second. Hello everyone. So I think uh, one of the biggest uh, things for me was that uh, when we began, every day was like some new challenge would come. Something that was beyond what we were used to experience would come. So that got one very important lesson on, you know, we are taught to work with communities in colleges, in programs, but what is it like to ethically engage with these communities? The ethics of engagement, that part, I think the Amravati internship clearly highlighted for us. Uh, we work closely with a lot of the local communities there uh, under Professor Gala's mentorship. And it was a surreal experience in the sense that we learned so much from the communities. A lot of time when we go to you know, communities, we go with a mindset that, okay, we are going to be helping. But this time we went with a mindset that we are going to be learning something new every day from these communities. So I think that perspective shift that happened for all of us there uh, was a very important aspect in how we progressed during those six months at Amravati. And it also set the tone for us on you know how we as individuals engage with communities at a later stage in our life in the projects we take up uh, and i think that has been very enriching also in the way uh, when we see that uh, now with other modules that we take and when we tell fellows that all right this is the approach that you take so we are also able to now see that journey and the transformation that they make on day one to the end of the program so I think uh, the Amravati experience uh, was very enriching in that sense for me. Uh, secondly, I also think that one thing in India I could say is that we are all not taught how to question a lot. And the whole idea that we went ahead was that we will engage, but we will also question things and we will reflect and analyze. So it's not just about criticizing, but it is also coming up with propositions on how do you, you know, uh, change things by not just telling okay, you need to change this, but you come up with solutions on what can be done. So those kind of approaches that we learned were very, very helpful in my understanding during the Amravati field school and the internship. What about women, gender, because I think... Uh... That was, I think, a key takeaway in the sense that we were working on an exhibition of curating stories through saris. So uh, all the local women, who were the daughters-in-law who came to Amravati, uh, the wedding sari is something that is very close to them. So uh, the exhibition was work, uh, working on curating those stories of the women and their emotional attachment and the story behind those, uh, like through those wedding saris. And what really came forward was that through the activities that the museum was doing, uh, a lot of women started coming out, speaking up, taking part in local activities, which was not the case before. So that shift that happened for women to participate openly and also men in their family during that process to start supporting them uh, was very uh, beautiful to see because uh, a lot of times what we see is that when we are engaging with local communities, uh, women participation specifically in rural context becomes quite difficult. So. Uh, during the exhibition uh, curation, when we were going from house to house for collecting those stories, uh, I did have a challenge of uh, understanding the language in the beginning, but it also opened up a great opportunity to learn a new language and engage with uh, communities through a different emotional context for my, me. So I think uh, during that whole uh, uh, process of six months while we were interacting with women in the community, 
we saw a shift that was happening from women uh, you know initially uh, coming in small numbers to then coming in large numbers so that was very wonderful to see okay Th thank you shagavi that that's really good i mean just to add a little bit uh, amravati once upon a time was the second largest city in south india but now there's only about not even 18000 people uh, and uh, it's uh, 2400 years old you know and if you it even goes back to the megalithic days uh, but it has exogamous marriage rules that means every daughter that's born in amaravati marries outside amaravati outside the village and that means that all the women that are marrying, they're, they're coming from outside their daughters-in-law. For too long, the story of Indian museums has been through the patriarchal male voice. So we were determined that we wanted to listen, you know, as the Ray said, deep listening and uh, uh, deep diving into the, you know, into the moment as David said, <laughs> fingers in the dirt, Jerry, your description. Um, we, we, we formed a network, invited all the daughters-in-law to come together. We did, we did a social atlas of Amaravati and encouraged uh, daughters-in-law to participate. But the thing is that in a patriarchal society, when a daughter-in-law comes from outside, everybody's trying to tame them, literally tame them, you know, sort of, it sounds crude, but that's what they do. But actually creating that camaraderie through the museum, through an eco-museum approach, um, you, you know, actually brought them together. So much so that the men who were initially hesitant about it, they didn't know what their daughters-in-law would be doing, the fathers-in-law. They started coming out into the meetings and saying, Frisgala, you know that lady over there? That's my daughter-in-law. And the next thing is they started actually sponsoring activities. You know, a farmer came up and said, uh, it, this is fantastic what you're doing. I want to make some donation. And uh, and he, he had substantial amount of money that he wanted to give. I said, don't give me, give it to the activity. Yeah, because if the money was given to me, it'll go into the government coffers, which you'll never see it again. And it's best that the community manages the activities themselves. So the impact of, um, I mean, you, you'll read this. Rutledge has asked me to write a book about this whole auto-ethnography and mixed methodology that I used in Amravati, what you find is that at the start of the pandemic, I wondered what will happen because that's when I moved to Ahmedabad, to Anand National University. But when I went back, I found out of the 20 projects we did, 18 were still continuing with no money from outside. Why? Because local ownership was critical. And that's one thing that whether it's in the 80s, or more recently I've always emphasized is local communities need to take ownership in cultural action. If they take ownership, it's sustainable. And uh, the second thing is that it's not just participation in consultation, but participation through actively self-help, through upskilling their, their own ability to deal with their own so issues and challenges in the local communities, which is what happened in Vietnam. And, uh, and the gender is something that, you know, uh, I belong to the 1970s, you know, sort of uh, very strongly inducted into, you know, gender discourse and feminism, and, and then later on into radical feminism. But the thing is that coffee house radicalism, with its coffee house communism, we were all neo-Marxists in the 70s. And, uh, but when you actually get your fingers in the dirt, the reality is very different. And uh, so working with the daughters-in-law was transformative. Uh, working in the daughters-in-law, just one example I want to give, um, okay, anyone who wants to post questions, please go into the question and answer box and uh, type away. Uh, you can also WhatsApp me, sometimes people WhatsApp me rather than type, of, type it up there. And, um, uh, I mean, one thing that I will never forget is, uh, it, it, you know, that the daughters-in-law, when they wanted to, you know, plant trees and green, Amaravati, 
They agreed to take WhatsApp images every month and share it in the group. How they're looking at what is planted? Because typically government has plants, a lot of things in India, but nobody looks after them. They die after a while. So the women said that we don't want to be like government people. We, we, uh, these plants are for our own good. So they were taking it, sharing on WhatsApp, how they're looking after them. Uh, even the Mother Goddess Temple, uh, which was diverted, it was revitalized, and uh, they planted, don't ask me why, but they planted 31 fruit trees in, in the half an acre land. And the temple Pujari, who is a potter, he belongs to the potter's caste. You know, he was sending me WhatsApp images. I mean, can you imagine, uh, you know, he was in his late 70s and uh, very active. Uh, and uh, taking images of the plants and sending them to me saying, we're all looking after the plants because they're good for us. See that, you know, when we talk about climate crisis, that local ownership, local action, cultural action is really critical. So that's great, four of you. You've taken me through a journey of my own life by talking about your experiences. And so to, now, there's a question that's come through on my WhatsApp, sorry. Uh, David, the question is to you. Going back from Netherlands to Harvard and uh, how, what kind of lessons did you share with your peers, other peer doctoral students in the graduate school? Sure, thank you so much for that question. Um, well, actually, at the time, I was a student at the University of Oxford, so um, it was before I got here to Cambridge, so I actually took those lessons back to my uh, peers um, in the UK. Um, and the, the main lesson, again, is sort of what I shared earlier, which was the value of kind of that shared experience, that group learning. Um, I think that was what I was probably uh, said, I, I went on ad nauseum uh, with my colleagues who weren't as, as fortunate as I was to uh, participate in the program. Um, the other thing I would say is probably I told my peers um, about the value of that sort of on-site learning as well, because of course we um, did a lot of uh, research in the libraries and archives. Um, but that kind of fieldwork aspect of the program um, really was, I think, uh, uh, an important lesson. Thanks, David. Uh, Ray, there's another question to you. Um, uh, did Vietnam Field School help you when you worked in, you know, in Delhi or Ladakh, what you learned in Vietnam Field School? That it's, that's coming from Australia, that question. Oh, oh, thank you. Yes. Yes. Well, the field school was two weeks and my time in Ladakh was four months and my time in Delhi was four months. So I had a lot of time to exploit what I'd learned in Vietnam. And what I'd, I'd learned was that you need to be sensitive to the people and the, the area from where they come. This deep listening goes to understanding what, uh, how you can help the most effectively. In Ladakh, uh, I introduced uh, a museum exhibition of a timeline of a day in the history of the educational institution that I was working in. So that uh, came from my the experience that I had, for instance, in the Women's Museum in Vietnam, and then the field work we had when we were staying in the village. So that it was a really grassroots uh, photographic exhibition into a culture that had no museums at all at that stage. It had monasteries, which were the museums. But the uh, society, the, the group uh, with which looked at my exhibition, I used it as an English language uh, course uh, project. So the students had to put their own captions on the photographs that I took and ran off on the solar, um, solar a printer, which you could only get to in the morning when the sun came out and quickly then mounted the exhibition. So when I went back, this was just 
absolutely significantly poignant to me, uh, seven years later, the exhibition was still up, but it was all in colour now, and it was developed and expanded. So this whole exhibition, what it was like to live for one day in this uh, wonderful educational uh, institution I was in, which was totally uh, made with uh, mud bricks. It was a, a, a alternate architectural adventure, and uh, but it. It served the purpose, as the Vietnam various museums we went to, of explaining the background of the institute, SECMO, and like they did with the, the like the, um, the Da Nang Museum, for instance, in Vietnam, which ex was so such a a moving experience to see really. Um, a museum that hadn't been adopted by the, the tourist community, but was a museum that explained the American war from the Vietnamese perspective. In, um, in East Timor, that was very different. It was a, I had to put, mount an exhibition that celebrated Chega, which was the Ruth Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. And we were living in the jail where Shagar and all the testimonies from the East Timorese for the report had been made. And we, I had to do a, an exhibition that celebrated Shagar, but in a country that had their museums had been traditional, partly Indonesian, partly Portuguese, and had been absolutely, was nothing left. The collections had gone underground. A lot of them have been sold internationally. So, I had no objects to work with, but I had an immense access to uh, talking to people and finding out through the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission what some of the testimonies were like. And so I mounted an exhibition that mimicked a massacre site that I'd read about and uh, involved a circle of ties. It was interesting hearing Shavari talk about the saris because the ties are like a, a traditional East Timorese uh, long scarf, handmade, and they're the only heirloom, except for that which the Catholic Church offered, that survived the Indonesian uh, occupation and oppression because ties were imbued with historical family and uh, Leap, uh, high, sort of um, family, genealogy, genealogy, then also geographic area, age, status. And so the, we hung the ties in a circle from the ceiling of the exhibition building, which was a, a Portuguese jail uh, cell, and it became an Indonesian jail cell, to which represented 13 ties, represented 13 areas of East Timor. And below that, we, we mounted the stones from an area that uh, a Gulch area that we'd had Timorese help to get the stones and loaded them onto a truck and took them into the, the cell, which was the, ex the exhibition building and put them in a dome shape because that was how they were placed originally when the Indonesians uh, ground zeroed and massacred a group of people in a village called Swai in a church. And they were so damaged that these Timorese had no bones to, uh, or no area, no, no material remains to bury. So they built this mound of stones. So our stones became a symbol of that massacre. And so when Shanana opened the exhibition, as with everybody, we invited those that could to use paint to paint a message of their lost ones of the in the occupation on each of the stones. And so the stones became the memory bank on that day of the launch of Shaga. It was it was a very touching occasion and it was a new to East Timorese experience because they lacked such cultural uh, experiences in through a museum environment, but it was totally adopted by everybody. And when I left, uh, I got an email that said, we had to go and get more stones because more people were coming in every day to memorialize there. 
their lost ones. Yeah. And that evolved out of my East, the Vietnamese experience. Thank you, Ray. I, I think you reminded me of a, a very interesting incident with David Lowenthal. You know, the past is a foreign country and uh, mm. uh, he's often called the you know, father of heritage management. He's no more. Um, in 1990, I, I organized a meeting of 19 people responsible for museum and heritage studies across Australia and Canberra. And out of the blue, somebody knocked on the door and the door opened. There was David Lowenthal. He was not invited. We didn't even know he was in Canberra. He said, to him, Mr. Chairman, do you mind if I join in? And everybody said, oh my God, David Lowenthal. And he came and sat down. He listened. He listened to for nearly three hours and had cups of coffee. And then he asked a very important question, which, which also helps with the importance of cultural immersions. Uh, sorry, there were 29 people. He asked all the 29, we were all professors and conveners from all over Australia. He, he, and, and the focus was on cross-cultural curricular development in museum studies and heritage management studies. He asked them the question, how many of you speak more than one language? Mm. Three people put their hands up mm. and he said, how many of you speak more than two languages? And uh, I was the only one to put my hand up. And he said, let me put it this way. How many of you lived in more than one culture? Uh, it's the same, you know, what three people put their hands up. He said, how many of you lived in more than two cultures? Actually living, not visiting, but living. And, and I put my hand up. And then he looked around the room. You know, these are all like professors in Australian universities. He said, you know, if it's just one culture, they, they're outsiders and insiders. If it's just two cultures, it's still us and them. Mm -hmm. If it's three, then you start becoming a multicultural sophisticate. He said, how can you teach cross-culturalism if you haven't lived in more than two cultures? He asked the question, simple question. Mm -hmm. And it became a recommendation to the prime minister and cabinet in Australia, you know, out of that workshop, you know, to facilitate uh, what are now called all kinds of opportunities. We, out of that came the Australian Youth Ambassador Program, New Colombo Plan, where Australians get an opportunity to go and live for a year, six months outside Australia. Uh, they can also do that in Australia. Australia is a very big country. So the cultural immersion is a way, a short-term solution for people to experience a totally different context. And uh, now, Jerry, the next question is to you. It's coming from Gujarat, <laughs> which you are quite familiar with. And uh, um, the, now you said you lived on campus or in a museum, right? You lived for eight days in the museum. David knows we met when I was living in the National Museum of Ethnology at the back uh, of the museum in, in Leiden, the Netherlands. In fact, it's only much later that I realized that in the 18, mid 19th century, it was actually a morgue. <laughs> the whole place, the whole museum was a hospital and uh, the morgue has been converted into an apartment. And uh, because the security people kept on asking me, have you seen ghosts? Have you seen anything at night time? No, I haven't seen anything. I'm sleeping well. <laughs> but the question is, you know, you've experienced what most Indians don't actually understand, an eco-museum, a museum campus. Because most Indians think of museum as a building. And, but it was like an eco-museum, like in Vietnam, or 200 acres of Indira Gandhi Rashtriya Manas Sangrali or the National Museum of Anthropology. And uh, now you're back. I mean, you've been back to Jamaica a few times. What do you, what do you think about? Can you re does it make you reflect on museums in Jamaica? Uh, yeah. So first of all, I um, mean, you know, I'd like to say I I'm not um, I I don't come from a background in museum. I'm an urban planner. So you know, my perspective when I look at different spaces will be toward or you know with some um, outlook as an urban planner. So after living at the museum, we have a similar museum that they were trying to develop here in Jamaica as well. 
um, it was an open ear museum and you were supposed to go in and sort of experience that. Because I specifically worked on things at the IGRMS Museum that had to do with the user experience, that had to do with how the exhibits were um, you know, protected, how they were showcased and things like that. It has given me um, various ideas about the types of museums that we have here and what we could do particularly to, first of all, first and foremost, is to protect the exhibits. Because, you know, in an open ear museum, once people go there, everything is open. You know, it's, um, they want to touch, they want to feel, they want to take a little piece and so on. So this has uh, made me think beyond what it is like for a visitor to go there and now think of um, you know heritage management in that sense. Um, I've I've been back to Jamaica a couple of times, but this was during the pandemic. I be, I'm back now just for a couple of hours. I I literally got here. Um, so now I'm in that mode where I will be thinking about it, and you know I will definitely go to the museum again and see what is there. I don't know what has happened. Um, I know that museums are open to the public again. I'm, I imagine people are going and they might want to be part of the uh, experience as it was, as the museum is itself promoting that you come see, feel, and be part of the exhibition as an open air museum. So the- Thank you, sorry. You... No, no, I say I said the, the truth is that, you know, I, I, I don't know yet. I, I'm now about to find out because I just got back. But one thing <clears throat> I wanted to add, you said, Professor Gala, about that, uh, you know, living in different cultures. Uh, this also, being in India also added many elements to my personal experience because that was also an immersive um, experience you know, coming there, uh, being part of a culture that I was completely not used to. And then, you know, um, meeting people from all around the world there, as well as having a, an experience with the IGRMS Museum, which made it all the more interesting um, as a complete foreigner going there, you know, not knowing some of the on-site implications, what some of the exhibitions met, meant. So I had to listen more, like Ray had said, you know, I had to listen more. And even though there was a language barrier, not just for me, you know, I also couldn't communicate with the um, local people there and they couldn't communicate with me, which meant that I had to just listen. I had no other choice, which made the whole experience of that immersion even more impactful because when they offer you something to eat or drink and whatever, that becomes now part of that whole immersive experience. You know, what it is that they're doing, exposing when they expose these elements of their culture to you that you get to interact with, that is also very different than if you just go to a museum and you visit for a couple of hours in a day. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, thank you so much. The next question is to Sharvari. Uh, uh, Shavari, the, the question, if I could interpret it, it came on my WhatsApp. Um, you, you're a young middle-class woman, and there are many young middle-class people, not only in India, elsewhere in the world, who just find it difficult to get out of their urban context. So what was it like for uh, a young middle-class woman to go to a village and to live in the complexity of the village. How did you find it? How did you, was it like an initiation ceremony into community engagement? That's the question. Thank you. Um, I think the first time when I went there, that was my first exposure to a rural setting for that duration, because previous to that, it was always for a very short duration where you do not have to experience the hardships of actually living in a rural context. So the initial few days when we were going around meeting everybody, they were great. 
then once that sweet period was over and when the reality hit i would say it was definitely challenging uh because a you have to get rid of the preconceived notions that you come with and also because i believe that a lot of us when we come from the kind of privileged backgrounds that we do we have certain expectations of what we should be getting so you know getting out of those comfort zones and understanding that where we are the the context is most important and not these materialistic things that transformation takes time it doesn't happen overnight there are days you will feel like you want to run away and but it is the the warmth the hospitality of people their powerful stories and also the amount of learning that you experience on each day that keeps you going like it for me i can personally say that once i was past that idea that okay x y z things are not going to be there and i have to adapt and i did adapt and then it was a smooth sailing very enriching and fun experience for me i wouldn't say it was the same for everybody because some people found it difficult to make that adjustment it took time everybody eventually did but it just took time for everybody and i think that i would recommend everybody to have that experience because that also gives you confidence that you will be able to survive in any condition and you will be able to adapt because it just teaches you so much more about life in general thank thank you shivri that that's great and uh, as uh, somebody that david and i know uh, from that immersion in the netherlands dr fedra livingston and she also did the vietnam field school fedra and uh, the only one line she uses is immersions are about transformative learning um and uh, that, that's what it's about and that's what we are trying to do with anand fellowship is to take people out of the comfort zone into transformative situations for transformative learning and what sherwari just said the answering that question is so important because in india uh, 73% of the population lives in villages and yet you never hear about them you know you hear about the big cities and all the everything to do with the big cities so how do all these people you know architects planners designers anthropologists educated in the cities you know how do they work with 73% of india i mean this is a huge challenge they don't i mean my experience of five and a half years in rural andhra pradesh is most of them don't know how to even talk to people so that that's why i think these immersions are really important uh the next question is to you ray Uh, are there many immersive community engagements that take place in urban planning especially in the australian indigenous context if so how is it being implemented <laughs> so that's a good question that's a really good question yes it's... so sort of what comes to mind but is not in my experience is an immersion in uh an inner city suburb that has high percentage of refugees or with um indigenous and um immigrant peoples and that's a very good prospect and a, a very possible one too for me for me as in a uh, students and for museum professionals to undergo but i suppose my role as running a museum loan service brought me into contact with uh, which is a borrowing service that serviced the whole state and became actually the largest in the world through the autonomy i was given by the museum and the 100 volunteers that i had working with me brought me into contact with some immersion when we did uh, field trips to collect material or interview people and uh, in my phd i've been in many suburbs within the cities 
of in Queensland especially, uh, interviewing people uh, about their use of the museum and what they thought of it and how they, they borrowed over the years. So I, it would be terrific if the museum courses people in, in our, our country introduced such immersions. But I've only been on the, the sort of the fringe, I suppose, of, of such. I've been in the country in immersions like Torres Strait. I've been spent weeks up there living in, in villages. I've been on the front line with Indigenous people opposite the Adani coal mine. And I've learned a lot of um, museum insights into uh, traditional ways of thinking, which were appropriate to a museum professional, but I haven't been in an urban one. Yeah, I think Ray, if I could add, you know, to what you've already said so eloquently, uh, for the question, uh, sorry, it's gone off my screen. I forget who I asked, but uh, uh, the simple answer is no. Uh, most urban planners, most urban planning courses don't actually create immersions with indigenous people. They're only just learning to create immersions with culturally and linguistically diverse Australians. Indigenous, very rarely. And I'll give you an example why this is so significant and so pathetic in a way in Australia. Uh, the example is that with Sydney Olympics, you know, when Sydney Olympics were being planned, a freeway, freeway was going to be put through Redfern, which is the, probably the largest urban uh, neighborhood community of indigenous people in Australia in Sydney. And nobody consulted the indigenous people. None of the urban planners consulted them. It became a serious protest. A lot of us went from Canberra to protest as well. So they had to deal with a diversion. And, uh, and I think that even when Cathy Freeman won the 400 meters gold medal, an amazing Aboriginal woman, while urban planners and others praised and they were so proud of her as Australians, they still fail to understand that they're just as equal as anyone else in Australian society. They need to be mm. consulted, that you have mm. to work with them. So I, I think that um, urban planners, I mean, there's some really good work being done in Sydney now. Uh, there's still some really bad work being done elsewhere by urban planners in Australia. But we're still a long way to go as an Australian, if I could say that we're still a long way to go especially in engaging with the indigenous people. And um, very often that's because they're not taught in universities how to work with communities. Mm -hmm. They get their degree in urban design and urban planning, but they're not taught how, they, they don't have immersions with indigenous people to learn the skills, the cross-cultural skills to work with indigenous people. And uh, it's a huge challenge in Australia, but it's, I mean, after 43 years in Australia, I can say that things have improved quite a bit. Uh, I still remember with uh, two people creating an apartment as the space for supporting Aboriginal people in Canberra. Uh, in 1977, there was nothing, no health service, no legal service, no support service, no council service, nothing. In fact, Aboriginal people were not even recognized in Canberra. And, uh, but now we've come a long way. There are nearly uh, 4,000 indigenous people live in Canberra. All kinds of services are available. So Australia has come a long way, but we still got to go a long way. Mm. And I think that what, what, what hits me hard in India is, India has, not, has rarely thought about services for indigenous people, for the tribal people, designated services. Yeah, you know, India is still a long way to go. Uh, to give you an example, the National Freedom Fighters Travel Museum built in Gujarat, uh, the shell, the building itself, very expensive building, has already been built without any content. So it's a container without the content. And now they're saying, what do we put in there? So my simple question was, did you, talk to any of the indigenous people, freedom fighters, because this is meant to be for tribal mm -hmm. freedom fighters. They said, oh, no, we didn't. And in fact, one of the people dealing with this earlier on in the project when before learning to be politically correct said, 
Oh, but first Garla, they're so primitive and illiterate. What do we consult them for? <laughs> I mean, so many of us try, you know, indigenous people or university professors, highly educated. And uh, but that's the situation in India. We're still a long way to go. Um, and uh, but I think globally it's a huge challenge working with indigenous people. And we're still a long way to go. But anyway. The, the next question is uh, <coughs> back to you, Sharwari. You're very popular. What kind of peer impact did you have? It, with your peers, you know, what you learned in Amaravati immersion. How did you share this and what was the impact with your peers? I think one, one thing that came straight through was that whenever I was engaging with other cohorts of Anand fellows, uh, it was very clear that we have to focus more on the context than, than you know, what are the surroundings uh, that you might experience. So that was one thing. And in terms of uh, how the peer review of peer sharing went, one was that I uh, and uh, my peers who were there with me during the fellowship, uh, during the Amravati internship, we also had a lot of exchanges within ourselves about our experience, about our learnings, and with the larger cohort as to you know what made that change, what impacted, and how that transformation actually happened for us. So that was one important aspect that uh, we shared with others. And I think uh, after that, we've also had uh, a lot of fellows reaching out to Professor Gala for more internship opportunities. <laughs> Thanks, Sherwood. <Sharon. laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, the thing is people reach out to internship opportunities, but the first thing they do, they ring. And they say that, oh, we heard so much about you. We read what you've written. We, I want to do an internship with you. And the next, the first question they have is, how much are you going to pay us? Oh. And that's a bad way to start. And uh, uh, because in Australia, when I used to negotiate internships, I always had to negotiate because people, when you go to do the internship at one of the institutions, there's staff time involved. People need to have the time. They have to supervise. They have to take a lot of responsibility. So that understanding, you know, is not is not there. So I've stopped taking interns because I don't have money to pay. You know, I wish I could. I mean, if I had the money, I would pay and take as many interns as possible. David, the next question is to you, David. <laughs> I and. Um, being responsible for art museums, art collections, and given your cross-cultural experience, and uh, uh, you know, in the immersion and subsequently, I'm sure, how do you think, or do you think that art institutions are dealing with the hegemonic aesthetic? Are they questioning the hegemonic aesthetic of the West? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess in a word, not sufficiently, you know. Um, so, um, you know, obviously there's, as, as Amar, as you were just saying in, in another context, you know, we've come quite far, but there's still very far to go. And a, unfortunately, sort of a stock answer of, across many, many different areas of problems. Um, through all of human endeavor, I'm sure, certainly in museums. But what I would say is that um, I think the current moment that we are experiencing in the kind of still the, you know, lingering and not really lingering, but ongoing effects of the pandemic. And as you mentioned at the top of the program, the Black Lives Matter uh, movements and all climate crisis, everything that's going on, I think it, it continues to present an opportunity for, um, you know, to rethink the ways uh, museums and other institutions and certainly art institutions, art museums 
present their narratives, the way we think about the kinds of collections we own, the kinds of objects that we collect moving forward, and what kind of stories we want to tell with these collections, right? And, and um, I think this is um, part, again, of the value of uh, cultural immersions of immersive learning experiences is that it helps uh, storytellers rethink those narratives. You know, the um, whether you're you know thinking about Ray's reference to deep listening, um, or you know, as he said, <laughs> um, that kind of deep dive, as as I was re referencing, um, the 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 narratives that um, institutions kind of adopt for themselves, um, I think right now more than ever, you know, we, we have to be extremely conscious of what we're doing. So I think, um, I think that's, at least I have some optimism for the future. I have some hope that we, we are, um, many of us in the field are really grappling with these issues when I think maybe it wasn't quite true in the past. Well, thank you, David. Well said, and uh, thank you. Jerry, the next question is to you. Um, given that you're from a small SIDS country, small island, small island development state, and like Jamaica, and uh, where the stereotype for the rest of the world is Bob Marley and, uh, <laughs> you know, but what is it like? Um, you know, being in India, then, you know, going back to, I mean, like these are two situations that are worlds apart. How do you straddle this difference? Uh, so I think the primary thing that was very different between um, Jamaica and India is, for me, is India on the face of it presents so much diversity in all in one go. You know, um, whereas in Jamaica, uh, as far as my lived experience was, it was, we were all just Jamaican and it was just one um, sort of experience or similar enough experience. India had all of these diversities that, you know, had many highs and lows in many respects. So whether this was social um, diversity or cultural diversity, it was very different. Um, being in the fellowship, one of the advantage that I had was that the fellows came from all around India and they were from very diverse backgrounds as well. Um, I think one of the things that I would take from that experience and uh, <coughs> kind of use now that I'm in Jamaica is empathy. Um, because being in a very diverse culture diverse group one of the things that you you're forced to do is to now pause and try to understand from the other person's experience their own lived experience and when they bring that to the table you know how do you engage with that this very different um experience they have from yours one and two um how do you narrate that to someone else? Are you going to tell it through the lens of what you understood? Are you going to tell it through um, an empathetic approach of what the person has shared? <laughs> and I think coming back into this society where uh, there are so many different things to engage with is that I will apply more critical thinking um, towards different um, elements of the society. Again, you know, I, I have to mention the fellowship this much because that's how most of my experience was. But being in the fellowship with so much diversity as well is you are sort of forced to engage in this um, kind of critical thinking because going in as an urban planner, before when I studied, I studied with urban planners and urban designers. Being there, you know, I studied with planners and architects and engineers and teachers and lawyers and doctors. So none of them had the same perspective about one thing because a planner would think very differently than a lawyer would. So that taught me that, okay, you know, you have to think critically to design a whole 
complete solution. You need very different perspectives that add to it and how each of these um, solve problems on their own, but together solving problems is a whole new ball game. So those are some of the key things I would take culturally. I love India as a place and I don't think, you know, this will be my last visit. I'll definitely be back. My dream still, one of the, um, speaking of cultural immersion, it's one of the reasons I ended up in India in the first place was for the Holy Festival. Like two years before I had even applied, I wanted to go to Holy. And then when the fellowship opportunity came up, I'm like, okay, here it is, I'm going. Having lived in India, one of the next things I want to do is go to a big fat Indian wedding that is just dancing <laughs> for five days on end. So I'll be back for those two things. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Thank you so much. We're running out of time, but there's a very broad general question to you, Ray. Uh, what did you find out the cultural commonalities between Vietnam and India? I know you talked about Ladakh. But India is so big, but uh, the question is to you, cultural commonalities between Vietnam and India. If it's too broad, well, can, you don't have to say anything, but it's up to I, you. Well, Ladakh is Indian. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, so uh, I can compare. Uh, oh. Both, uh, both outward looking, uh, <sighs> It's very different. Ladakh has, is like a naive democracy experimenting with how to address the West and how to um, make the right decisions. It, it is a, a society that's come full circle into valuing its own culture. People wear traditional clothes there, whereas they used to wear Western 15, 20 years ago. They've reinvented the education system to suit their uh, curriculum, uh, to suit their, to be accepted by the Indian uh, curriculum. But since the Indian curriculum was all about the seaside and, and lakes and things that they don't have, they wrote their own textbooks. So they're immensely um, confident, uh, wonderful uh, empathy, uh, com very confident in their cultural and religious roots. There's half a Muslim and half a Buddhist. They have a heritage site right in the middle of town. It's the oldest um, uh, medieval uh, sort of uh, avenues of uh, artisans that they're gradually restoring. And they've used the West for their own purposes into how to adjust to it. So the institution that I work for, Sekmal, it was run by a Ladakhi and he is now setting up, he, he was in a way an urban planner and in a way an engineer and also an architect. He, he used traditional methods to combat climate change impacts. And he, as I say, revolutionized the education in the country. They had village education committees and they, it was just, uh, and they have a sign in the street saying, um, do not urinate here. And then they have a suggestion box in the middle of town where you could put your suggestions in. And they were on top of corruption, which they exposed in a local newspaper. And uh, they, Whereas in Vietnam, Vietnam was a much more sophisticated society. It was hugely diverse in uh, outlook. You compare Hanoi with Saigon. They had uh, experiences of oppression, which Ladakh didn't have. India had, in the Southern India had always respected Ladakh's uh, characteristics and, and preserved them. No Ladakhi was allowed to sell their land to any other um, Indians in from different states. So it preserved a was enormous established uh, foundation for their uh, cultural future. In Vietnam, it's it was uh, driven uh, 
enterprising, outward looking, completely Western embracing in many respects society and a very exciting and very ambitious. Thank you, Ray. Thank you so much for that. We just have one and a half minutes left because people have other commitments. They will start logging out. Um, David, if you had an opportunity, you're, let's say you're 18 years younger, um, you had an opportunity to do one of these immersions, would you do it? Oh, without question. Why do I have to be younger? Why can't I do it now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I would seriously would recommend anyone who has the opportunity, I think, and seriously at any stage of life. I mean, we're um, always uh, capable of learning. Right and changing, and I think we should, especially as we get older, uh, really apply ourselves to to learning new things. Um, I think an immersion program would, is an excellent way of doing it. The difficulty, of course, is creating the time. Um, you know, later in our careers when we're so busy and people want us to teach things instead of apparently learn things. But I think it's it's an ongoing process, and so would be very happy to. Maybe I'll apply for the Anant Fellowship uh, next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well actually the, for me Anand fellowship is an immersion you know being involved in it and uh, I, I just want to finish up by sharing a couple of things why I started doing immersions is the founding director of UBC University of British Columbia Museum of Anthropology a very famous museum which you know innovated many things including open storage indigenous protocols uh, Professor Michael Ames, he worked both in the Northwest, but also in India. Uh, so he, he, came, he came to Canberra. Uh, he was on an Australian trip, spent a couple of days with me. And he said to me, Amara, I've been following the trajectory of your career from having no indigenous people participating in museums employed, they, you, the program I ran had more than 200 people getting into museums, galleries, libraries, archives, national parks. So uh, he said, how do you do this? And Amar, since you don't believe in dollies, I mean, those of you remember Dolly was the clone pig, you know, since you don't believe in cloning, how can you do something, you know, to clone the skills and everything that you pull together, the pedagogy. And that's how I started doing intensives. Um, and, uh, and in terms of what age for an intensive, David, you know why I do it? I'm addicted to intensives. I'm, I'm addicted because every intensive, I've just come back from Bhopal, you know, which had two World Heritage sites, indigenous people, the museum that Jerry talked about where people stayed inside the museum. Each time I go, I'm learning something. You know, and each time I go, I'm growing a little bit. So it, facilitating, convening one of these immersions is, is so rewarding. I mean, I can tell you, I was brought up, um, when I first went to Australia, I was at the Australian National University, Every lecturer looked at right in front of them. They had a clock in front of them in the lecture room. <laughs> they talked to the clock. They didn't talk to the students. And I just thought, I don't want to ever be like these lecturers, you know, talking to the clock rather than the students. So after I finished my PhD, I spent a whole year working as a teacher's aide and library assistant in a primary school working with little ones. And so that's why I learned about deep learning with, with little ones. That's, that's where I learned what empathy is all about. So if I'm doing a field immersion, it's based on that, what I learned one year, you know, with little ones in a primary school. And, uh, and, and having a PhD from Australian National University and having spent time at Cambridge and Jawaharlal Nehru University didn't mean anything to me because I wanted to be a good teacher. So, so thank you for sharing all your experiences.